Welcome back. We are in Genesis chapter 1 still. Yeah, let's, let's do day 4, verse 14. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have made us, you have made this earth as a habitation for us. You've ordered all of this creation to serve us that we may in turn serve you. So bless us now as we read your word. May we uh, increase, our, increase in our faith, uh, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we would cling to our Savior Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so chapter 1, verse 14. So if you remember, creation is going to have a rhythm to it that all things are going to come about by God's word, but in many cases what he's going to do is create and then order, right? So he creates the heavens and the earth on day one, and then over the next couple of days he orders that earth, assigning boundaries to the seas, separating the waters in the heavens from the waters below. And so here, he's going to continue that work. Verse uh, 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the, expan in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Yes, it was the beginning of time. So we have, well, time's already begun. Because we already had evening and morning on day one where we had light, but not sun and moon and stars. So, what we saw with the earth, where in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we're told at first the earth was formless and void. And then God puts order to the earth. That same day he creates light. He says, let there be light. But as we know, and as many of our neo-atheist friends are glad to point out to us, while the Lord created light, he did not create the sun, moon, and stars until day four. Well, how does that work? Yeah God, God, yeah, God created the light, and then he created the sources of the light. That becomes rather important when... The Bible makes it clear that the earth is on the order of a few thousand years old, and yet we see the light coming forth from stars that are more than 6,000 light years away from us. One, when God created the, the universe, he did not create an infant universe. And how do we know this? Look at Adam. How old was Adam when Adam was created? He was a man. He was one day old. But he was walking with the Lord and talk, with, talking with him and reasonable and old enough for marriage. Y right. Yeah, I, I would say that 6,000 years ago, our Lord created a 13 billion year old universe. Right. I mean, if we were to look at Adam on day six, when he's, the day he's created, that day he's not even a day old, but he's going to look to us like he's, I don't know, 17, 25, 40. He's not an, in, in other words, he doesn't look like a newborn. I mean, one, Adam was never born. But we'll get to Adam in a, in a bit. Um, so God places the sun, the moon, the stars. And of course, the sun and the moon are not named, but the greater light that rules the day and the, the lesser light that rules the night. The sun, the moon. Now notice, does, does a, a literal reading of this text demand a geocentric solar system? No, it does not. I don't know why people think that. <laughs> well, the Bible says the, the, the earth is in the middle of the... No, where? <laughs> Martin Luther. You, I, I think most 
I think most people understood something of, of the nature of one. Ancient people did not think the earth was flat for the most part. So, so here's the thing, right? For what purpose does God create the greater light, the lesser light, and the stars? They're for us. So for example, how was it possible for navigators to sail to the new world reliably? Navigation by stars. And you could say, well, couldn't, couldn't you just sail in the direction that the sun sets? It'd be, <laughs> that's, that's rather imprecise. <laughs> and There's, yeah, the, 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 the sun doesn't set in the same spot in the sky. Plus, um, that's only one point. One point's not really good enough for navigation, is it? Especially if you want to be remotely precise. The Swedes thought they could just sail due west, and they, they know that they're used to northern climates. They're used to northern latitudes, and so they just sailed due west, which put them in Hudson Bay, and they almost all died when their ship got frozen in over the winter. And then they turned as soon as it thawed, and they went back to Sweden, and th thus ended the Swedish colonialization of the New World. <laughs> They're like, we're, we're used to cold, we're Swedes after all, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> so, you, you, you navigate by, you, you need like three points, right? So that, so that you can know where you are. Having a reliable system where you know where the stars are going to be in the sky allows you to do that with a, a rather good amount of precision. Why are those stars the way that they are in the sky? Moses tells us they're for us. If you read like um, Hesiod, Hesiod is a, is a pagan, uh, he's, he's Greek. He's writing in the 7th century BC, so very, very ancient. Hesiod writes about um, farming practices of the time. I find it fascinating. Um, and he would talk about when this certain constellation is at this spot in the sky, then you know it's time for these animals to be born, or it's time to plant this crop. So they watched the sky to the degree they knew. They would time their, their agricultural practices on the stars and the planets. And even we count time according to the sun, right? More or less. Twice a year we get a little angry that we don't do that the way we want, but... <laughs> but more or less, our day is reckoned according to the sun. And our month is, is reckoned roughly, very roughly, according to the moon. Right? So, these things are not just random happenstances. The Lord intentionally creates them for man's benefit. Again, that puts a little context when you get Carl Sagan talking about billions and billions. As a matter of fact, like so famous is Sagan for saying billions and billions that you can just refer to Sagans of stars, right? Billions and billions of stars. The whole point is when you see these presentations about the true size of the universe, you know, look at the amount of space between if, if the, the moon is this ping pong ball, then the earth is this, you know, giant beach ball and, and we'd be four kilometers away at the next, you know, whatever that is. They always do that. And then eventually when they get to the very end of it and they show the true scale of the universe and the size of the star Betelgeuse and the local cluster and all this stuff, they'll say, now doesn't that make you feel small? That's so inverted. God put those things there, those, those tremendous things in the sky for us. And as we've built instruments to look further and further into the sky, you see more evidence, not only that there is a God, but that he really loves beauty and order. I mean, as, as, as we put the Hubble in the sky and now the James Webb telescope, which is a tremendous thing, which is able to see... I mean, even now its results are, are, are quite fascinating. The photographs we get of these objects that are just unfathomable distances, you see glory of creation that looks a lot like the kind of things we see on Earth.
You, you look at the, the seas or a mountain um, or, or a moose. I think mooses are pretty. <laughs> and, and you see God's love of beauty, and it's out there too. What's well, the same God, right? And all of that was made for us. So rather than us feeling small, we should feel blessed. God did all of this for me, for signs and seasons. Okay. Again, a lot of God's ordering involves separation. I hope this is not terribly uh, controversial. That part of God ordering creation is separation. That the moment of creation when everything was all together was when? The first instance of day one, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. Because then everything was all mashed together. It was basically a big mud ball. When the earth becomes beautiful and, more important, habitable, is when the seas and the land are separated. When the heavens and the earth are separated. When the light and the darkness are separated. Those distinctions are God-given. They are God-made, and they are good. They're not only useful, they're morally good. This is important when we live in the 21st century and we've had over 100 years of various strains of Marxist thought that seeks to break down culturally conditioned barriers between one thing and another, right? That's the whole point of that insipid John Lennon song, Imagine. Imagine, and he's just tearing down all of these these legitimate God-given gifts that separate things from one another. Imagine no possessions. Yeah, my possessions are mine. They're not his. And that's good. Do I? Yeah, the WEF, yeah, you're, you're going to live in the pod. You're going to eat the bugs. Right. The World Economic Forum. They're what happens when people, like, found their whole life around being, like, comic book supervillains. It's, it's hard to mistake. But, so if nothing else, one of the things that we should, we should articulate is that one thing is separate from another, or at least distinct from one another, is likely God-given and good. For example, men and women. We have to do a lot of that now. Didn't have to in the past, because everyone kind of knew it. But now you have to articulate men and women are distinct creatures, that distinction is more than just superficial. It cuts down to their, their chemistry and, and their bone structure and down to their souls. The soul of a boy is different than the soul of a girl. We used to know this, but now we're going to have to rediscover it. So, some things are distinct, and that's God-given, right? And you notice that the distinction between things is part of ordering the creation that is placing order into creation. Okay. And notice that God saw that it was good. He places his approval over the creation at the end of day four, and then Moses tells us there was evening and there was morning, day four, the fourth day. Yeah, light, light and dark are, are created, they're good. Also, light and darkness are going to be very important to God's moral teaching, right? Right? No, I'm talking about light and darkness. I mean, just, just the simple fact of light and darkness are going to be very important because, especially in John's Gospel, Jesus is going to, to use light and darkness to teach about the distinction between good and evil, right? And that's the distinction that we most need to maintain, the distinction between good and evil. And of all of the distinctions that Satan would like to destroy... Good and evil is the one he's really after. Now, he might get it at the side from, you know, attacking things like creation, men and women, um, private possessions, that kind of a thing. But he's really after the distinction between good and evil, right? If we can eliminate that distinction, then we can call evil good or good evil, in which case we're doing the work of the devil. You can pick what pronouns you want. Why? Because God didn't make me. I can be who I want. I make me. Right? Yeah, the, the devil loves that kind of thing. All right, day five. 
<laughs> and God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. We did that already. Okay, verse 20. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. Okay. So, if you didn't appreciate this already, the Lord has a great sense of drama, but he also has a great sense of scientific taxonomy. He hits us in both brains, right? He starts off with that which is less sophisticated and less categorized, and he adds complexity to the system, right? First, he, he creates the matter, and then he orders it according to greater complexity, right? So the things that are least complex, the earth, come before things that are more complex, like birds, right? But there's also a sense of a building action dramatically, right? Because all of this is going to lead to what's the climax of creation? Man. We're not there yet, but we're building toward it, right? Animals and birds, they're not us. There's a distinction. But they're like us in some ways. In fact, the command that they receive is what? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Man gets almost the same command. We get one more step than they do. But he tells... You're right. We don't have wings. So, um, notice that not God doesn't just create just creatures that just go where they want and do what they want. He purposefully creates creatures for the environment that he places them in. So the sea creatures he makes to live in the sea. The winged creatures he makes to live in the air. That's, a, that's actually a decent point, I think. That's a good point. Yeah, so ta uh, ta ta um, herpeta. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And if you notice, he does differently with man and woman. Now this is excellent because man is going to be born from what? From God and from the dirt. Woman is going to be born from man. And the... No, thank you for that, by the way. Um, that the sea is going to bring forth the the sea creatures, the land is going to bring forth, oh yeah, there, there are lots of animals that, that kind of, they either exist on the margin of one or the other or in both. I mean, to the point where we have entire classifications of animals that are amphibious, right? They live in two, literally in Greek means they have either life, right? And yeah, in, in, the, in, the, lat, or in, in the Greek, and I'm, I'm glad she brought this, this out, um, in the Greek, the, uh, the waters are bringing forth reptiles. The, the Greek there is herpeta, right? It's the Greek word we get a herpetology from, the study of reptiles. Verse 26. Nope, sorry. We almost skipped some, some creatures. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. I, I mean, I, I, I genuinely don't know about a lot of the specific imagery of, of the beasts from the sea and the land and everything, because there's so many different ways to take it. Um, it I mean, it, it well could be. I mean, if, if, if nothing else, we, we know that in Revelation there's a, a constant theme of the, the satanic inversion, right? That you have, you have a mockery of the resurrection, for example. You have um, things that look like they're from God and they mimic what comes from God, but it's backwards. So, I mean, that's, that's entirely plausible that 
in, that the beast that comes from out of the sea in Revelation is a mockery of God creating the, the, the animals that come out of the sea. I mean, that's, that's a consistent theme in Revelation. Okay, so now we have living creatures, and this is a very generic word for living creatures. But then we're told, specifically, the livestock, the creeping things, the beasts of the earth according to their kinds. My guess would be that we, and we moderns would probably call these mammals. That does seem to be the, the ordering of things where you've got fish and you've got birds and you've got the stuff that comes out of the waters and now you have the strictly land animals, and specifically including livestock. I do intend to ask the Lord why the mosquito when, when I see him face to face unveiled. I mean, because you, you can imagine certain insects having, having something to do beyond just harass us, even honeybees, but mosquitoes. Yeah, right, they're, they're food for bats. Purple martins like them. Yeah, well, I mean, flies will at least break down like carrion that's on the ground. I don't know. We had, we had to have a term for the kind of person that just like goes around and listens, right? Okay. But you notice this theme repeats everything according to their kinds. So it's not just God creates animal and then just animals randomly divide into what they are. He intended the creatures to be what they are. Everything according to their kinds. And the Greek here is genos, from which we get the word genus, right? Everything according to their type. So, I mean, each, each specific sort of animal, the Lord creates them to be the way that they are. He's pretty busy. He's very busy. All this in the span of one day, right? And he's not done. The day's not over yet. Because now creation is going to come to its climax. It's going to come to the high point, what everything's been building toward. And notice that he creates everything first. Why? So it's already in place when we're there. Right. Okay. Look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay. We're going to spend the next 17 weeks on that verse... <laughs> it is really important. It's, an, it's, it's crucial to our understanding of the Bible, right? So crucial, as a matter of fact, that we usually encounter it finger spaces And I am pleased to report that we Lutherans do have an official teaching about what the image of God consists of. <laughs> Yay! It's in, the, it's in the Augsburg Confession. And that is this. The image of God consists of original... Now, your mind wants to fill in the blank original sin. That's because you're living this side of the fall. But it's related As a matter of fact, the image of God is original righteousness. That is, that mankind was created morally good in the image of God, right? That's what gets lost in the fall. We lose the image of God in the fall. It is not damaged, it is destroyed. That's actually fairly controversial among theologians. Because... Many theologians, especially in the modern day, want to appeal to a John Lennon sensibility, a brotherhood of man, the idea that, well, we're all created in God's image. No, we're not. <laughs> we lost it when we sinned. But we'll get there in chapter 2. Um, <laughs> Does that mean that men didn't look the way we look now? I assume we did, but 
without, without death. I mean, what does a human body look like that never dies? Well, I mean, this is, this is the thing. The, the form would probably be there. We would be likely bipeds. We would likely walk erect and speak. We'd have our eyes in the front of our head and have four chambered hearts and give birth to live young. But what does a human body look like that has not been affected by sin? I'll tell you later, because I'll see it the same day you will. <laughs> For now, the image of God is going to consist of original righteousness. Since the time that man fell into sin, that's what we gave up. And so all of, it, I don't think that it's just that we would not recognize a human body. I'm not sure we would recognize creation. For example, what would it be like to stand beside a grizzly bear without a, a, a fence or bars and not be afraid of it? There was no predation. Right. No predation, no death. I mean, what, what does creation look like? The, the whole ecosystems without death. Because now, I mean, death is, we talk about death as a requirement. Like if, if trees don't die, then, then they'll all go up in forest fires. So, notice also that when God says this, he doesn't just say, let there be man in his image. This is going to be the time when God himself says, let us make man in our own image. You get the idea that, that God's creation here is very personal. It's very careful, very methodical. And notice also, and you pointed this out, you're exactly right, he says, let us make man. Who's the us? This is the Trinity, right? This is an inter-Trinitarian conversation that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are speaking within himself. It's weird to talk about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and use himself, but such is the mystery of the Trinity. Nothing was made without him, which is to say the word, which is Jesus. Yeah. So, God, the triune God, says, let us make man in our own image, right? This is going to be a very personal, it's an it's a, it's accumulation, right? And he says, let them, that is man, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This is enormously important in our day. All of this is, of course. But this verse especially is going to be important because it is denied many times that man has the right to make use of the earth. And there are some radicals that will say that man is a parasite upon the earth. I hope so. <laughs> They'll say that, that man is, 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 is not proper to the earth, that the animals were here before us, maybe by one day, maybe by less than a day. They were here first. What does that prove? <laughs> right. But again, understand that, that Satan wants to undermine everything that is of God, especially regarding creation. The church, because of the attack since, since well before the time of the Reformation, but, but through the time of the Reformation, the church that remains is pretty well defended against, God, uh, against Satan just saying, God isn't real, Jesus didn't die for you. That works sometimes, but most people are, are well defended against that particular attack. But come at it from the side. Well, God didn't create this. He couldn't have created this. Right? Man, man doesn't belong here. We're parasites. We're not proper to the earth, right? We should st and, and where does this come into? First of all, it comes in, into fertility. It is implied, if not outright, explicitly stated that, that, that men and women who get married and have children are being selfish and are depleting the world of their precious resources. Now, what's funny is the people who firmly believe that there are too many human beings on the planet never do the obvious thing about it themselves. They continue living. They just don't want you to. And they don't want your kids to. Again, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an appeal to a roughly Christian-sounding virtue, caring for the earth, and we should, we'll get there, but 
doing it in a way to undermine the command given to man. Because what does God say to man? Well, the first thing is he says, let them have dominion. What is dominion? Lordship, rulership, yeah, to have rule over, over it. So we don't just have stewardship, we have lordship over the earth. So what gives us the right, for example, to dam up a river and provide arable land for the, the earth around it? God's explicit command that we have dominion over the earth. Now, are we free then to exercise that dominion however we please? No, we're not. So, for example, there are these absolutely lovable but terribly slow animals that live in the Everglades. They don't do well with speedboats at all because they're so slow and they like to float near the top, right? Well, we could just say, well, you know, them, uh, them dugongs, they don't, uh, or what are they also, what's the other name for them? Manatees, thank you. It was not coming to mind at all. The manatees, they're just not well adapted for an environment in which they can compete with speedboats, right? They're the loser in the war of competition, therefore they, they're just not fit to live. But what do we do? We order our running of speedboats so that we don't harm the manatees. That's good. We're, our dominion is supposed to be creative in nature. That is not like God where we speak things into existence, but at least to care for and maintain the order that God placed into creation. Yeah, that's the nature of this dominion. We're to take care of it. Right. Right. And so people can appeal to that. Well, you, you know you're supposed to care for the earth. Yeah, we are. And therefore, you shouldn't have babies. Whoa. <laughs> I mean, for example, all through the 70s, one of the great um, sky is falling schemes of the time was overpopulation, right? Because, well, at, at current yields... The crops that are planted can only support X number of people. And what happened? It happened well before the 70s, but... Limits to growth, right? Right. There are limits to growth, and we discovered that we can manufacture ammonia. And what does that do? It replenishes the nitrogen in the soil, and now yields that were really great in the 70s, they'll make you go broke today. I mean... I remember going to the ag room when I was in high school, and I graduated high school in 1998, not that long ago. And I remember in the ag room, we still had plaques up of the 100 bushel club. I mean, there are parts of, of, of land in the U.S. now where 100 bushels would be good, but Ohio is not one of them. And Ohio, if you're not getting at least double that, you're doing something wrong or something happened, right? In other words, as, as God blesses the earth with more people, he continues to provide for them. But we're told, if we have children, we're being selfish. That doesn't come from God. What do you think about the heathen that overpopulate? The heathen that overpopulate? Yeah. They do. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But, I mean, they, 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 have, a lot of, they have a lot of children. And, on Chinese couples at one time. Sure, and yeah, the, the, the Chinese had the one-child policy, and now they're in demographic freefall. The, the Japanese and the French will never recover. I mean, mathematically, they can't. Okay, verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So that's God's explicit command to mankind. And by man, I mean the race of creature that begins with the man, Adam. Right? So which, which creatures come forth from Adam? Eve, Cain, Abel, and everyone else. Right? All of us. Okay. So, and by the way, that's what we mean when we talk about man in many cases, like in the Nicene Creed. Who for us men and for our salvation and you all know this, we're not saying, well, uh, it doesn't say for women, therefore women aren't... You all know that that's not the case, right? Ma by man, we mean the race of Adam, that is, all who come forth from Adam. Okay. But notice, he gives the same command to man as he does to the creatures in be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. But then he also says what? Subdue it. What does it mean to subdue it? Order 
to it? Yeah, control it, right? Um, you, you read stories about the, the colonization of the New World, and they began with just und, undifferentiated woodlands and forests and, and swamps and what has to be done. You clear out some of the trees, you build in roads, you might, make, um, you might change the course of a river if it helps. Um, you might put up a, a seawall to help keep the sea where it belongs. So subduing the earth involves all of that work to tame it, right? To exercise dominion over it. So what gives us the right to clear out, clear out forests? God does. Now, does that mean that we can just clear-cut as much as we want without any thought to the future? No, that's hating our children. Sure. So, for example, if we pollute the oceans, is that exercising godly dominion over the sea? No. We have the right to use the oceans. We don't have the right to abuse them. Right? So, we can operate vessels in the waters. We can even fish and take fish from the waters and eat the fish with a clear conscience. Can we exterminate entire species in that? No. Can we go to war with the Chinese for doing that? No one ever asked me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even studying things like the organelles, the, the, the parts of a cell, you know, the, 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 the tight constraint in which your, your blood has to hold salt concentrations. And it does all of that without your, your will one way or the other. And, it's held, and, and, it, and it stays there for the most part. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the more we learn about the anatomy of, of the body and cells, and the more we learn about what the universe is made of, it, it just gives further and further witness to the order and the majesty of our Lord. Yeah. And look at verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. So, Again, what gives us the right to harvest plants for consumption, God tells us that's what they're for. I have given them to you for food. Now, for us who love to grill, we're a couple chapters away yet. <laughs> that will come, but it hasn't yet. So far, the Lord has only given the plants to man. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Yeah, the pre-fall diet, right. The thing of it is, is that, um, if, if you don't know, God explicitly gives animals to eat uh, after the flood of Noah. And many people have argued that because God only gives plants before the fall, it's more righteous to eat plants than it is to eat animals. However, who is it who gives animals to Noah? God does. Yeah, so again, the Lord is, is establishing a hierarchy in the earth that the animals may eat the plants that man has dominion over all the animals and the earth, and he may eat the plants, right? So that, that hierarchy is God-given. It is prior to the fall. And it's, it's godly because the hierarchy is not just man's at the top so he can do what he wants. It's not. It's his duty, it's his burden to care for the animals and the plants and the earth. In fact, that is his work. And a lot of what we do, we parents, we employees, we homeowners, we're fighting against, we're fighting against nature trying to undifferentiate itself. Right? For example, trying to keep roofing tiles on when the winds are, are strong. We're having to fight back the forces of nature. Well, um, why, why do we care about, for example, populations of deer or game animals? They're our responsibility. And if we're going to clear out the predators, which we, which we have the right to do, we need to figure out how those populations of game animals are going to be managed. That's a lot. That's an enormous burden. But it's ours, right? So there's a hierarchy. We have the right to do it, but that also means we have the duty to do it. 
And notice God makes a moral claim about the state of creation at this time. He says it was good. Now, you might have also noticed that at this point, the account of creation is not entirely complete because there is yet one creature that's, whose creation has not been recounted to us, and that is woman. That's going to happen in chapter 2, right? Paul will mention in verse 27. Yes, in verse 27, uh, and thanks for not letting me skip over that verse, um, God creates man in his own image, and he says, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, created he them. Right? So, the idea of, of male and female comes from God. It, it's real. It exists. Which one possesses the image of God at this point? Well, right now there's just man. But he does say them. In the image of God, he, cr he created him, that is man. Male and female, he created them. And, and at this point, all of creation, to include man, is without sin. Yep. Any questions on through uh, day six? All right. Then um, next week, we'll talk about God resting, and, and then we'll get into chapter two. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you all.